Hi, welcome to Viewfinders, the podcast that delves into the minds of some of the world's best photographers. I'm your host, Graham Dargie, and today my guest is Mark McCall, a landscape photographer from Scotland. Mark's work has been featured in the London Times, The Herald, Outdoor Photography Magazine, Landscape Photography Magazine, Practical Photography, and he leads photography workshops for leading to a company, Light and Land. Landscape photography has been home turf for me these last couple of years, and I really enjoyed meeting a photographer with as much experience, knowledge and dedication as Mark has. Our conversation ranges from Mark's background as an NHS doctor, his first experiences with old film SLR cameras, photography as a stress reliever, why he always keeps silicone grease in his kit bag, and much more. If you're into landscape photography, you're going to find a few takeaways in this episode. If you enjoy the episode, please subscribe and leave a five-star review. It's the best way to help me get this show in front of more listeners, especially in these early days. You can connect with me at the Viewfinders webpage, where you can also get my free ebook, Three Steps to Better Photographs. Okay, here's my conversation with Mark McCall. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the podcast. How's things? Hi, thanks, Graham. Thanks for asking me onto this. Uh, yeah, all, all, all good, uh, considering you know what we're doing this year and... Uh, all the restrictions we're currently living under, particularly in, in Scotland, uh, announced earlier today. But yeah, all good, thanks. Tell us a little bit about the kind of photography that you do, Mark. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, I, I, I've i always been interested in photography since I was a, a child, really. Um, you know, I, I was um, fascinated by these big clunky SLRs back in the 1970s and, and 80s. And the uh, first camera I ever owned was a Russian Zenith SLR, which, although it was big, bulky, uh, entirely manual, uh, including the aperture ring, um, and didn't cost very much, if I remember correctly. I think I, the first the first one I bought cost about fifteen or twenty quid, so they, were, they weren't expensive, but they were big and, and clunky. And but I was fascinated just kind of holding these things, and uh, was absolutely useless at taking pictures of them uh, with with it, of course, because the, the first roll of film I remember putting through, um, I forgot to to manually close down the aperture ring, so they were all shot at f two point eight and grossly overexposed. But I, you know, I got the hang of it, um, and it t- but it took me a long time to sort of find my way in photography and university and social life and all that sort of stuff got in the way and it sort of you know fell by the wayside a little bit but you know I I came back to it I think probably more seriously about 20 years ago Um, and it's really you know it's kind of grown arms and legs ever since then Um, I didn't set out 20 years ago to you know become a photographer and run workshops or anything like that it really started and and still is predominantly a, a just a passion that I have and I think you know it's very difficult to analyse exactly why we why we do these things, and and you know nature and landscape photographers do them for all sorts of different reasons. But I think one the one thing that probably connects us all is 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 just getting out and connecting with nature, and that's that's kind of what drives me forward. It's you know, and I think that's become very very uh, crystal clear this year with 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 the pandemic and potential you know on and off restrictions. I think just getting out and getting into the the environment, connecting with nature, being on your own, being able to kind of focus on just one thing, using a different part of my brain, a more creative part of my brain than perhaps I use on a kind of day-to-day basis in my in my work, um, is 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 what really you know keeps me going. But I just you know live for. Well, it's going to sound really strange. I live for getting up early at ridiculous o'clock, and um, you know mm. sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't, as I'm sure you know. So just to dive back in time a little bit, and I was curious about your childhood experience with the cameras. So you described getting your hands on the on those old cameras as being um, quite something that really caught your attention. What kind of age were you around at that time? Probably kind of. 11 12 13 that that sort of age i i think and i, I remember you know having these the, the these old cameras and, and lusting after other cameras which were um you know better and professional you know olympus cameras were sort of you know the big makes back then the om1 and mm-hmm. things like that you know were, were, were really kind of you know almost the pinnacle of, of photography back then and um I, and i've still got some of my cameras i've i've got a, a nikon em which i haven't put a roll of film through recently but that was a that was the entry level nikon slr back in the kind of early mid 80s with an aperture priority camera um and um but I haven't shot film for a long time. I got into digital photography probably sort of when when the first consumer models came out. The Nikon D70 was the first one I bought, which was, mm. ooh, I think, about 2003, 2004, around about then. Mm. So about sort of 16, 17 years ago. Um, 
it, I remember it. I remember it broke uh, just immediately before uh, I had a trip to Applecross and uh, Wester Ross, and I uh, made an impulse purchase of a Nikon uh, film camera again at that point, and took some rolls of film and shot film. And that would have been about two thousand and six, I think. My daughter was uh, only one or two at that point, and that's probably the last time I shot any film. Um, and so, did you potter with the photography then in your teens, and then it sort of went away for a while? Is that is that just to get the timeline right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I pottered about in my teens, went to university at kind of 18 into 19, studied medicine, and then, uh, you know, photography, didn't do any photography really then, to be honest with mm-hmm. you, of, of any note. Um, that was pretty much full-time studying and, well, and a bit of socialising too. Mm-hmm. Um, and then kind of early years in medicine, kind of 1990 onwards, um, working, that was kind of back in the, the bad old days of medicine. We worked, we worked kind of 120, 130 hours a week. Um, so again, not a lot of time for doing anything other than working, to be honest with you. Um, but once I'd finished the sort of um, postgraduate training element of things, kind of late nineties, that's kind of when I when I came back to photography again, and then uh, into um, into digital photography in the early two thousands, I guess. So was it that sort of freeing up of time that allowed you to come back to, it, or was there something that triggered you to say I'm going to pick up the camera again now? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I think it's probably a cu- culmination of things. I, I think probably getting older, um, um, you know, having done a lot of the socialising during the 90s, settling down, uh, a bit more kind of time on my hands, a bit more of a kind of, um, I don't know, thinking about what I want to do with my life. And, and again, I think I, I'd been quite a keen hill walker, actually, in the Scottish Hills. In the 90s, I had a circle of friends. Mm. We we walked a lot of Munro's back in the kind of mid and late 90s. So again, I was always kind of keen to get back out onto the hills and, and things. But um, yeah, I, I, I think it was just, a, you know, a rekindling of that, um, you know, desire to get out, to connect with nature. Um, and when my daughter was born, um, you know, it's time becomes even, as you'll know, you've got a, you've got a young family. So, I mean, time becomes very constrained I think when you're looking after young kids um, but you do need your, you do need some time to get away and kind of just you know, put a bit mm-hmm. of time on your own and get back to nature again and that's probably part part of what um, part of what drove it too. Mm. So that sort of culmination of just needing that something to do for yourself wanting to get out into nature and, and I think if you're into walking photography it's a, it's a good complement to that hobby I guess as well isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, the other the other thing is that I, I certainly have found that as time has gone on, that there is this, um, with photography, there is this sort of, and I'm sure many people will, will recognise this, it's a, um, you know, we go out, we have a session, we might have a few days away, even just a morning shoot or an evening shoot or whatever, um, and, and that satisfies this itch that has to be scratched every now and again, but I find that, that uh, the, the scratching of the itch becomes more, more and more frequent with, with time, and I need to do it more and more often. So what what does that give you then when you go out for that morning? I, I know for me that it can be hugely refreshing and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what does that do mm. for you? Yeah, I mean, it has the potential, you know, I think almost irrespective of, of, of whether I come back with something successful or not, it gives me a, a bit of a buzz. I just, I love getting out there. I love standing behind the camera, usually on a tripod. Um, as as I said earlier, often it's silly o'clock, just waiting on dawn light appearing. And if it happens and I get some nice images, then that's great. If it doesn't happen, I don't feel any pressure. I used to feel pressure, I think, to get images, you know, years and years ago, but I don't feel that pressure anymore. I, I've got a fairly big back catalogue of images now. So if I, if I don't get images on a particular shoot, I'm not that bothered. Um, but it, you know, certainly get a you get a very big buzz and a big high um, and I'll go back with a big smile on my face and feel a lot happier with life in general. And so, okay, so I'm interested to ask if you, if you're a doctor, I suppose I'm, I'm making a big leap of imagination here because I have no idea. But um, you're you're diagnosing, you're analysing, you're putting clues together um, as to what might be going on with somebody. What from from that learning, from that skill set, uh, from being a doctor, I wonder what can transfer into your photography. Have you noticed any sort of transferable things that you do in both um, disciplines? Yeah, for sure. I mean, perhaps less around the technical aspects of making images, but I think the one thing that I find that's transferable from my 
job as a doctor is communication and it's being able to communicate with people actually um which is what's led to me running workshops yeah, i think if you're if you're an mm-hmm. effective communicator which i think doctors have to be um, then you can probably pretty much talk to anyone about anything um, and you have to be able to communicate across all kinds of levels and be able to explain things um, so it's it's definitely communication. I've also I've had a long-standing interest in medical education, and I've, I've held some positions in the health service and in relation to, to to medical education. So that's been, you know, kind of organising training and training courses and all that sort of thing has been quite quite helpful actually in transferring across to running workshops and just being organised as well. I mean, I think I think um, you know I, I think as a as a medical professional, you have to be pretty organised in your work. You know, we're 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 busy, so I think just having organisational skills is pretty important too. But I mean, it is definitely a different part of my brain that I use when I'm taking images and making images compared with what I'm doing um, during during the, the, the my job as a doctor. Uh, they're, they're almost entirely separate, I, I find. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think those probably are the transferable skills. So just on that point, is there any... I was, I was wondering if there's a tension between those two different parts of your thinking um, or if, if it's just one release the other. I th- I think the photography helps my uh, work as a doctor in many ways and it's a bit of a stress reliever. I mean, I think if you've had a difficult week or a difficult consultation or, or whatever, um, you know, and I think we all go through ups and downs in our, in our day jobs. I think the, the one thing that will get you away from that is, is to, is for me anyway, is to go and go and take photographs. Um, and again, it's about connecting with nature and there's no question that whenever I'm out, um, yeah, particularly if I have a number of consecutive days when I can take photographs I don't think about work at all I don't take those problems mm. out into the field with me at all um, it, in fact it's quite the reverse I think it helps me forget them and it helps me probably become a better doctor because I don't take these problems home with me I don't, I don't carry lots of baggage looking at your feed there and on your website you've been in some amazing places really all over Scotland Iceland Faroe Lapland some you seem to really like cold places um, <laughs> If there's one experience that stands out I, among all of those, because each time you're out there in one of some of these amazing locations, it's a great experience. Hmm. Um, if there's one moment that really stands out as unforgettable, what would that be? Wow, that's a difficult question, having been to all these places. Um, I would say probably Northern Lights. I mean, I think I probably can't get enough of, of watching Northern Lights um, in, in the, inside the Arctic Circle. You know, it, I've, seen, I've seen Northern Lights in Scotland, but it's, it's not quite the same um, and it's not the same experience. Um, but, you know, you know, standing underneath Rip Roaring Aurora, which can go on for hours and hours and hours, is just absolutely unforgettable. Um, mm. And I can remember how I felt and, and what I was doing and who I was chatting to on, on lots of different occasions when I've, been, when I've been shooting Northern Lights. And I've been lucky enough to shoot it in Finland, Sweden, Norway, Iceland and Scotland. Um, and it's it's been, it, I mean, I think that's for me, that's probably the, the, the one standout uh, thing that I've done in, in my life photographically. So if if there's a if there's a best place, I don't know if this is an answerable question, but what would be the best place to go for that? Well, I think Tromso is probably uh, an ideal uh, place to go to, um, which is up in the very north of uh, Norway. Um, it's relatively easy to get to. Um, two flights probably from most of the UK. Um, I go from Edinburgh um, and, uh, and and up to to Tromso. Um, you know, you you spend about five or six hours flying but it's so different when you get there and I can from Tromso airport I've I've seen me get off the plane and two hours later be photographing Aurora literally within two hours of getting off the plane I've, I've done that on a couple of occasions so mm-hmm. I think Tromso is probably one of the and around there is probably for me is probably one of the, the best places in the world to shoot Aurora and every time I've been there I've, I've seen Aurora um, okay so if you're going to you go to a, a place like that you know what you're looking for the Aurora and I suppose with a lot of landscape locations around, it's possible to go out with something in mind. Do you shoot that way or how much are you planning and how much are you sort of flexing in the moment when you're out shooting? Yeah, I think it's really important to be flexible and open and not go out with preconceived ideas because I I've, I've found that if you go out with preconceived ideas of what you're going to shoot, be it nighttime or daytime, it'll probably not not happen. I think if you've seen a picture, for example, you've been influenced by a picture either consciously or subconsciously and you want to, you know, go out and sort of try and capture something similar to that, I, I, I try not to do that. 
Um, and I'll try not to do lots of research on locations that I go to. I'd like, I'd, pr I'd prefer to go there and, and actually just have a look myself. I mean, I think, you know, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say that I don't look at some things on Instagram when I go to a new location, but I think it's important to go out there with fresh eyes and not be overly influenced by, by that. But for sure, I think you need to have, you need to be open-minded and flexible when you get to a location. Um, and I would tend to go somewhere, recce it first and then go back when I think the light is right. But even then... I think you have to be flexible and you have to accept the fact that sometimes you need to just shoot things that are, are maybe that perhaps you hadn't planned on shooting depending on where the light is or depending on what the conditions are like. So really, really important thing, I think, to be flexible. So when you, you, you get in that spot and you know this is the, more or less the place for you, do you have any sort of compositional guidelines or particular ways you're looking to arrange things and maybe not that's not the best way to uh, to phrase the question but um simple guidelines that you might follow to help find your way to the final picture i think i mean i i, I tend to sort of break it down into sort of you know the the timing the light and the composition and i think these are the kind of three key elements for me um the composition is important but i think without light often it often things won't work if you could have a very very strong composition then it can work almost irrespective of what the light is doing but I, I what I teach on, on or what I try to teach on my workshops is is a bit of patience and and it's about not about bagging lots of images but it's about trying to get an image um, mm -hmm. and if we get an image on a day shoot that we're really really happy with then that's great and, and I would be prepared to to wait for the light and if that takes a wait of several hours then so be it um, if it doesn't look as though the light's going to happen, then potentially I'll move on. But if I think it's promising, then I think patience and waiting are really, really important in landscape photography. And, and certainly that's the feedback that I've had from, from, from workshop clients. In terms of, I mean, obviously, you know, people will, will have heard of rule of thirds and, and all the rest of it. And I think that these are important. And I think, you know, lead-in lines are important too. I've certainly found that I have over time become perhaps a little bit more, in terms of lead-in lines and rule of thirds, a bit more flexible with all of that. I don't, I'm not, particularly keen on very obvious lead-in lines i would probably try and avoid avoid that you know avoid the obvious um but um you know i think you know uh, in terms of you know skyscapes landscapes you know two-thirds sky one-third one, one third foreground or the reverse are probably things that i kind of look at initially um either for my own pictures or if i'm looking at someone through someone else's viewfinder as a kind of starting point um I like trees. It, it, it's funny, actually, when you do talks. I, I do, do a lot of talks, and I know you do a lot, a lot of talks as well, Graham. It's amazing when you go through your back catalogue and you're preparing images for talks. I suddenly realise that I, I don't know why I'm not hugging trees, actually, because quite mm. clearly I'm in love with them. Um, and, you know, I've got so many tree images, it's absolutely incredible. I'm just back from the Outer Hebrides, and it's one of the few places in which I don't take many tree pictures, uh, largely because really there aren't that many trees there. Mm. But, you know, I, I, I just take so many tree pictures. So if I can get a tree, if I can get a tree in an image and shove on a third then I'm probably going to do that but <laughs> equally I might just shove the tree right in the middle of the picture too and I might decide I like that as well so mm. I don't stick rigidly to compositional guidelines I think they are guidelines but I think they are there to you know they're there to try and guide you but you know I think something that's pleasing to your own eye is, is more important than anything but mm. for me it's definitely about light as well the light has to be right so uh, you said you just come back from the Hebrides and um I, it's not presumably the first time you've been there so when you're revisiting locations like that well what kind of what were the spots that you were looking to hit when you were there um yep. so that gives you an insight into my thinking about photography i'm looking to get mm. a hit and mm. move on but anyway um mm. what were the locations that you visited there and when you're revisiting like that um probably touches back to something we've already touched on but how do you sort of keep that fresh eye when it's a, a place you've been to mm -hmm. maybe a few times before yeah so um for the hebrides uh, i was particularly interested in some of the beaches and, and seascapes and again in terms of you know how do you make that fresh um i think that when i went to some of these beaches i first visited the hebrides about 10 years ago with a couple of friends um and and it was it was very very quiet then there was almost no other photographers there there mm. then at all it was it was it was uh, and it's still pretty empty actually it's it's not exactly you know busy with photographers i don't think but there are it's certainly it's a more well-known location now um 
there, I've, you know, there's a couple of lovely beaches down in Harris, Luskintyre and Scarister, and all down that um, um, sort of southwest um, um, coastline of Harris is absolutely stunning and beautiful. And there's lots of different things you can do. And certainly, I, I went with a friend. I was meant to be running a workshop uh, there two weeks ago, but that, that had to be cancelled because of the pandemic. So I, I went out with a friend for a bit of a break. Um, and we had a great time, you know, we, um, on the beaches, you know, we, we went along in overcast days. There was no, there was no directional light at all, but the wind was holding the waves up. So if we have, mm. if we have wind coming from, you know, heading in, heading out to sea rather than inland, that can hold the mm. waves up and you can just shoot the waves, uh, particularly as they come over. So we spent a, a, a kind of morning doing that. And that's just very dependent on, on the wind direction. And that was fantastic. I got some lovely images that I'm really, really happy with. Mm. Uh, and that, that's something that I wasn't shooting 10 years ago. So even though you're on a beach, there's lots of different ways you can shoot that scene. Obviously, if the tide's out, you've got, you've got um, um, you know, lead-in lines from the sand, depending on where the sun is. You might be able to get some, some angle sunlight on that. So you go to a scene like that, and it depends on, on where the tide is, depends on what the wind is doing, depends on what the light is. So you can go there umpteen times and come back with lots of different images. And that's just, you know, one example. The, the other, the other uh, locations that I absolutely love in Hebrides are the old abandoned croft houses. And I, mm. I first started photographing them 10 years ago, uh, um, photographed an, a number of them. Um, both inside and out. It's amazing what you find inside these old croft houses. Uh, you know, there, there's I found magazines from the 1980s and old televisions, beds, you name it. It's all there. Mm. Almost all of them seem to have a, an old range that's in there. I found one um, when I was there uh, two weeks ago, which had a, a sheep skull in it. <laughs> Mm. Uh, rather strange, uh, slightly macabre looking, but um, mm. you know, interesting nonetheless. And I think it's important to photograph these 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 things and important to photograph these buildings because they won't be there forever. And I think you mm. know, if, if nothing else, they're a record of of a a, a bygone era that uh, has, has has moved on. Some of them are really beautiful and in beautiful locations too. And I found one or two. Um, abandoned croft houses that I hadn't been to before, that I hadn't visited, that required a bit of a kind of you know yomp, you know kind of romp across uh, Moorland for kind of half an hour and 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 just exploring. So so that that was fantastic. That was great. So that there's always lots of 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 new things to find. In terms of the, 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 the areas that I've visited before or some of the croft houses, for example, that I photographed several times before, I find that, that they're just different depending on, depending on the light. You know, if you've got, um, you know, blue sky and fluffy clouds, well, OK, but for me, that doesn't, that's probably not the optimal conditions for me. I like it mm. pretty heavy, pretty moody, overcast conditions. Maybe, you know, maybe kind of, you know, storms kind of blowing in and blowing away. That's, you know, maybe shooting at that kind of uh, overlap of when you've got maybe some rain just coming down, just going off, some stormy uh, um, clouds, and but light just breaking through. You might mm. have 30 seconds to shoot that shot now and then it's gone. Those kind of conditions are my favourite. And that's why I like going in September because in Scotland, the, the weather in September, October is just so changeable and you get mm. great light like that. So it's, it, and it's the, it's the, the season of rainbows. Mm. It's... Um... I always say the the same as well. If all I all I'm looking for is sun and rain at the same time, um, and that'll yeah. keep me happy. Um, so yeah, looking at your photography, um, I I see a very high standard throughout a, a broad range of work, and obviously you've been at it a long time. So your your landscape shots are very immaculate. I was gonna say, and you've mentioned it already, but your astrophotography is really really strong, and. Um, I I feel like to get that high of standard over a, a wide range of work like that, um, it takes a lot of skill and dedication to achieve that. So um, I was interested to talk about those two aspects. So if we can um, dive into the sort of camera skills side of things, and then we'll come back to the dedication after that. So um, if I was to ask you if you have a sort of what's the first thing you, that comes out of your bag, camera and lens combination? OK, so um I would tend to travel with probably two camera bodies. So I'm using Sony uh, mirrorless stuff at the moment. So a Sony mm -hmm. A7R three is my kind of my go-to camera body at the moment. Generally carry three lenses with me. So I've got a 24-70 f2.8. I've got a, a wide 16-35 um, f2.8. And I've got a 7300 f4. And I, I have other lenses. I tend not to carry them unless I'm doing something specific. Um, maybe some astrophotography, I might take an, a, an additional lens along. But those are the three lenses that I tend to use. Um, mm. 
I've got a, a Gitzel tripod. It's big, it's heavy, um, but it doesn't rock around, which, so, so, so I'm happy with that. Um, and um, so, yeah, probably 2470 is probably the lens I shoot most on, um, mm. on, the, on that camera. Um, I use filters, so I'm sort of, I guess, I don't know, old school. Uh, I, I use Lee filters, I use ND grads. Uh, I, was, I was having coffee with a friend this afternoon and we were kind of chatting about filters and uh, I was saying I could probably get away with two or three filters at most. Uh, if I had to, I would have a 0.6 hard grad, I'd have a three stop ND and I might have a six stop ND and that's probably it. I rarely use mm. a polarizer. Um, I don't use a 0.9 grad because I think it's too heavy generally. Um, and I probably you probably don't need a 0.3 uh, ND grad um, because the dynamic range of your of camera sensors is so good now. Um, mm. And that's one thing that I've noticed. And, and that's I think that's why astrophotography has come on so much. The camera sensors are so good now. Um, but but also the dynamic range, particularly of I think of all the ca- all of the cameras now is very good. But Sony and Nikon in particular, I think dynamic range is just incredible. You can almost shoot for highlights and bring back detail in the in the shadows um, mm. now. And um, but I, I I still feel that I want to get the picture right in camera, and I want it to look good on the back of a screen because I think I'm much more likely to process that image than if it looks you know blown or overexposed and mm. and, and things. So I still use filters. I like to get the the, the exposure right in camera. Um, I've 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 met lots of photographers over the years, and and, and I hear the, the sort of the, the the trigger going, and, and there's three three images taken, uh, and and I often ask what they're doing, and they're always bracketing, and um and I never bracket, <laughs> or almost never bracket, and I, I I sort of struggle to to work out why people are bracketing all the time. I, I don't really get it, mm. but um, yeah, so yeah, still probably old school in my technique um, with filters and things, but um, that's just me. Yeah, that's good. I, I I resisted filters for a long time and I, I would be in Sky and the only person without a thing on the front of the camera, you know, um, and I, I wasn't even bracketing. I just the camera um, I was using just had an incredible dynamic range and I would bag a Sky and a land if I needed to. But generally I didn't. And um, but once once I, I sort of gave in and got the filters not long ago. Um, it just does make it that bit better to have it there, doesn't it? I mean, it, it just brings, the, mm. the grad in particular brings it all together. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have any problem with bracketing, though I would I would be mm. happy for anyone because the filter kit can be so expensive sometimes. Um, mm. Mm. True. And so I would, just to go back to your lenses, I was going to ask you if it was um, the 24 to 70 you were using because I, I, I noticed that you, you, your shots don't have that wide, wide look. Um, you know, where the foreground is pulling in towards you and the sky is expanding up at the top. Um, you just find that 24 is a more comfortable place for you? For sure. Um, I, I I think my photography has evolved over over time. Uh, I think my images have become simpler. I try to include, I, I when I'm looking through the viewfinder, I, I, I'm thinking about what really needs to be in this picture rather than how much can I get in. And I think there's a, a, a there's a, a tendency when you buy a, say, a 1635, you know, you have to shoot everything at 16 millimeters. And I was guilty of that many years ago. Mm. You know, I have to try and get as much in as possible. Absolutely, I don't think that now at all. And with the 2470, I think it, it certainly fits the focal range of what I'm shooting at most of the time now. But as I say, most of the time I'm looking and I'm going, how can I simplify this? How can I get the most impact out of this? What really needs, what are the crucial elements in this? What can I, what needs to be left out? Mm. And I think what's what's left out is is as important as as what's left in. Mm, that's great advice. Um, this is getting really nerdy, and I'm sorry to ask this, but are you using a a ball head or a pan tilt head? <laughs> it's 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 a ball head. Uh, yeah, it's okay. uh, it's a uh, 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 really right stuff. Ball head. It weighs a ton, but right. it it could probably withstand a direct nuclear nuclear strike. I would think uh, it, mm. it'll outlive me. So do you tend to use the, the there would be a viewfinder um, a spirit level built into your camera, presumably? Is that the one that you would use? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm tending to. Yeah, I used to have these little things that, you know, went into the top of the of the, the hot shoe, but I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not using those anymore. Yeah, the, the, the built in spirit level on the back of the camera is, is what I tend to use. Mm-hmm. I mean, actually, if we think about what these cameras can do nowadays, it's absolutely incredible, really. Just to go back to the camera briefly, um, the mirrorless camera, what advantage is that giving you? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think um, I think there are pros and cons there. Um, I think obviously you're with 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 
big megapixel sensors, one of the concerns is, you know, if you have a mirror that's slapping up and down all the time, it's, it's about camera vibration. And I know mm-hmm. that when the, the, the 5D, Canon 5DS, for example, came out, that was a concern. Um, you, you don't have that with mirrorless cameras. Um, so that's less of a concern. Um, they're lighter. There's no doubt about it. They're smaller. They're lighter. Um, I was a Canon user up until about four or five years ago. And before that, I was a Nikon user. I've settled on Sony now because primarily because the the sensor was just so good. Uh, it, 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 it you know they make they make sense. They make the sensors for Nikon, and uh, I think that Nikon buy them for a reason. And mm-hmm. you know I think the sensors are primarily, you know, if your start if your starting point is image quality, then I think that's the first thing you have to think about is how good is the sensor in this camera. And secondarily for me was ergonomically how does it feel? I got mm-hmm. used to the to the Sony. It's taken me a little while. Um, you know I think the the iterations of the the A7. R series have got better and better, um, but the downside is dust spots. I, I think you know there's no doubt. I think they do hoover up dust more than than SLRs mm. do, and I've certainly found that I'm cleaning the sensor more often just with a, a, a blower brush now than than I than I ever did, um, and perhaps doing a bit more cloning out of dust spots, mm. um, particularly if you're doing contrasty shots. So if you're shooting into the sun almost you know it, it doesn't matter how how clean you think you've got the, you've got the sensor you're still going to get get some dust spots mm. and things on the, on the final image that's going to need to be cloned out mm. but overall i think that the weight reduction i mean i've probably shaved about a kilo uh, in weight off my carry around kit by going mirrorless which has been great um mm. and 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 they've just become so good i mean they really are it seems to me that you know everything's going to be mirrorless eventually i, I think you know the the advantage is grossly outweigh the disadvantages. We're getting frame rates, which are silly. I mean, I'm using what's regarded as a landscape camera, but it can still shoot 10 frames a second. I mean, that's mm. absolutely phenomenal. Um, yeah. For the wildlife photographers, you know, you can shoot 20 frames a second now. It's just absolutely incredible. Mm. I think there's certainly the big horses out of the barn in, in, in that regard. And when Nikon and Canon went in to the mirrorless, when they really went in maybe last year or so, when they took out their... SLR equivalents. I thought that this is the nail in the coffin for the SLRs, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just to go back to what you were saying about um, dust on the sensor, and we're getting really, really, really nerdy now. But what kind of um, aperture setting are you using? Because I, I'll be shooting at f11 or so, and you don't see that the dust spots are not as sharp. You know, are you where are you on that range? Yeah. So yeah, most of the time I'm shooting at f11. If I'm trying to, if I'm trying to, shoot, if I'm shooting into the sun, for example, I was at the Callanish Stones uh, week before last, and doing a, a a mixture of you know hiding the sun behind one of the stones and then doing and just you know embracing the shadows and but you know a bit of kind of peeking around and and a, a bit of you know sunburst as well. So for that, stopping down to bit f16. But yeah, that that that. That certainly, you know, brings out the the dust spots more than anything else. But yeah, most of the time, I would say I'm shooting about f11. Yeah, okay. And so, um, final super nerdy question before we get into some really interesting stuff. The next section is so interesting. Um, the I was curious about white balance because um, I I was I've always find myself shooting things in cloudy nowadays. Just it mm. just seems right more of the time than mm. than not mm. um what do you have anything to say about white balance preferences no not really I, I, quite often I, I i leave it on auto white balance um um it, it, it sort of depends what 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 i'm doing uh, if i'm doing you know shooting um star trails for example then i'll, I'll set it to a, a particular white balance but rather than leave it on auto white balance but but often i'll just leave it on auto and i'll i'll play around with the temperature um, in in Lightroom. I'm using, in terms of post-production, I'm using Lightroom probably more and more. I think a lot of photographers are finding that Lightroom is becoming more and more powerful and you can do a lot of post-production stuff on Lightroom. Mm I, I was, you know, brought up on Photoshop, um, but but I'm doing so much more in Lightroom. So I, I'll often just adu- adjust the temperature to what I remember it as, or indeed what I want it to be. Um, I don't think as photographers and landscape mm-hmm. photographers we need to have to be slaves to the truth. I think that, um, you know, I want my pictures to look realistic, but, you know, there is an artistic element to it as well. But, you know, if it looked very cold um, and I want to warm it up a bit, well, that's okay. That's that's then the prerogative of the of the photographer to do that. Yeah, and the tools allow you to do so. So I think it's all fair game. Absolutely, and I think you know the grad filter, the grad filter in Lightroom too. I mean, you can you can bright, you can warm up the foreground and cool down the sky. There's lots of things you can do. It's so powerful now. Okay, more interesting section, or or maybe not. I'm going to ask you about your clothing because I think this is really important. You're out there in the cold for a long time uh, potentially, and it's fine when you're carrying your bag and you've got your heavy tripod, as you said. You're making your way 
um, at your, into your location. But once you get there and you stop still in the location, it can get cold really fast. So um, are you... Um, I'm just trying to find the, the least boring way to go at this. But You're going to ask me what my underpants uh, brand, uh, brand are. <laughs> I wasn't going to go as far as that, but um, I was curious about you. <laughs> I was curious about your your layering because I think it's I've discovered sure. merino last year and it, this has been a revelation for my lifestyle. Um, what are you doing with regards to layering and footwear? I'm really interested in your footwear. People are tuning yeah. out. Now. Okay, so layering, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. L- 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 layering, uh, yeah, merino wool. I've got a, I've got a, a number of merino wool base layers, and absolutely, uh, I agree with you. I think I think they're fantastic and they're great, well worth their money. Um, you just don't want to tumble dry them. That's the main thing, or else they end up fitting your dog. Mm. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, so yeah, layering. So I tend to have a base layer, often merino wool. I'll have a a, a fleece. I have a, a a bright red fleece. I pretty much wear everywhere I go photographically and depending how cold it is I've got a couple of Paramo jackets um, they're I think they're very good um, they are they're great because you can you can uh, re-treat them with neck wax and the water just beads off so for the Scottish mm. so for three seasons I think in Scotland they're really good you know I think when it's raining and it's not too cold I think that I think that's fine certainly when I go to the Arctic they're not warm enough and you need you need something a bit a bit warmer than that so I've got a, a uh, an arctic parka that i tend to take with me um footwear i have got sort of scottish mountain hiking boots that i tend to wear they're waterproof i was wearing them on the beaches of harris and, and lewis recently and they were absolutely fine kept my feet dry all the way through i've got some decent wellies too i've got some arctic sport uh, muck boot arctic sport wellies which i've taken to some very cold places with me and they're great you know you know i've certainly been been stood in minus 25 minus 30 um, and my feet are, are still nice and warm with those. Um, hands, I think, are probably the one the one thing that I struggle with a little bit. I've got mm. I've got a condition called Reynolds phenomenon where I get a bit of kind of you know spasm of the blood vessels in my fingers, particularly the right hand. So I, I the, the, the kind of cold and wet Scottish climate tends to be the worst for that. So I find it much worse actually in Scotland than I do when I'm in you know the, in the Arctic actually because it's much drier there. Um, so actually keeping my hands warm and dry is probably the biggest challenge for me. And I've, I could probably open up a shop um, selling outdoor gear, particularly gloves. And, it, and, and the current gloves that I like the most in the very cold climate uh, is um, uh, by a company called The Heat. The Heat Company, who make, um, I think they started off making gloves for the Austrian army. And they have little, um, they've got um, little pockets in the front and back where you can put hand warmers. And you can, mm. unz- there are mitts that you can unzip and it'll bring out, you know, little um, wool gloves that you can operate the camera with. And then you can put your hand inside the mitts and that you, you can have hand warmers inside them. So I, I find they're, they're actually really good in cold climates. Okay, that's great. I'm going to put the link for that in the show notes because I think people will want to see those. So I realise someone listening to this who was not into landscape photography may not realise the importance of that section. But to me, I, I thought... Um, cause you, you just despair when you see people out there with, you know, Converse and leggings because it can turn so cold so quickly sometimes. Absolutely. Um, you know, the saying for landscape photography is to get there early and stay late. So I think you you already alluded to you're you're quite happy with the early mornings. Um, so that's not a challenge for you to get up early and drive a couple of lo- hours to the location. You're not really dragging yourself out of bed for that, no? No, not at all. No pain, no gain. I, I find getting up is not hard actually, but especially when I'm going to a good location and I, mean, I, I don't sleep, I'll get kind of anxious and I'll, I'll even have dreams. I was in Glencoe last November and I was really anxious to get this shot of, you know, the waterfall with the buckle. And that was the shot, you know, for me that I wanted to get. So I was really mm-hmm. stressy about that. And I was, I dreamed the night before, I was just dreaming about being in the location and, um, so when you're when you've been um, planning to a trip, say to Tromso, Lofoten, um, even Sky or places that are quite accessible for us, do you get that kind of anxious energy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I I certainly find um, I think you kind of alluded to it. That actually, yeah, difficulty sleeping actually, particularly if you're getting up, you know, pretty early, could be an issue. And it doesn't matter what time I go to bed. I go to bed and and think of myself, okay, well, I can function in five hours. I can function in six hours, whatever. But yeah, it's not unusual for me to wake up, you know, immediately before the alarm was due to go off, and perhaps had a kind of fitful night. That's that's probably the norm for me. Um, if I'm doing consecutive 
you know nights if I'm running a tour or something, it's probably much less of an issue. I think um, um, because I'm 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 not thinking particular. I'm more thinking around about just making sure I get up and clients are okay and hoping we get some some decent mm-hmm. conditions. If I'm doing personal photography, yeah. If there's a particular shot that I you know I really want to get or I you know haven't been out for a while, then yeah, absolutely. I I, I do understand completely uh, what what you're saying, and it's not unusual. You know, to you know, rock up to Glencoe. It's a two and a half hour drive from where I am. Um, maybe on three hours sleep, and then try and shoot. You know, for maybe four or five hours, and then you know, by early afternoon, I'm really I'm starting to flag a bit because I've had mm. you know very little sleep. So, <laughs> yeah, I think we can probably both identify with that. Mm. Uh, just let's uh, move on to printing. I, I think I saw a video on your YouTube channel, and uh, printing is quite important to you. How important uh, do you feel like it is to have that final printed image? Yeah, um, really important. Um, um, when I was going, when I was a member of CAM, I, I'm still a member of a, a of Air Photographic Society, although I'm perhaps not as not as a regular attender at it as I, as I used to. But when I was entering competitions, printing was was always the the the, the thing that I I entered, um, and I did my uh, distinction PAGB award back in 2009, and that was based on prints. That was based on 15 prints that had to be of ex- international exhibition standard. So that was always based on prints. So. Printing for me has been a big thing for 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 a long time, um, and I think there's nothing quite like um, holding a print. There's something about the tactile um, ability to feel that lovely bit of paper and see the colours and and see what it looks like printed. And putting it behind, uh, you know, putting it behind a, a a frame and putting it on a wall. I mean, I think you know, for for me, it's the final, it, it, it's the it's the the final you know piece of the jigsaw of putting together that image. And I know that that's something that that Charlie Waite uh, has 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 alluded to as well in, in many of us uh, it, it's it's the it's the final fitting um um element of, of of that scene that you saw is to have a you know inner print on a wall in an exhibition or just in your home or in someone else's home mm. so yeah printing is, is, is a big thing for me i i really enjoy making prints you know whiling away a couple of hours up in my studio and making some prints is is, is something i love doing mm. um I, I know you're running workshops with uh light and land and um yes. how did that come about yeah, so I was um, uh, I became friendly with one of their tour leaders, uh, a, a, a photographer, a very talented photographer called Tony Spencer, um, and and um, he suggested to me that uh, he asked me a couple of times if I if I wanted to run something, co- co-lead something with him, um, and we ended up um, doing it through Light and Land, and, and and they invited me to be one of their one of their tour leaders, and I've run a number of workshops for for them over the years. So we started off with a, a workshop in in Sky, and we've been we've done various locations in Scotland through through Light and Land. Um, so mm. that's been been very worthwhile, and it's opened up um, um, a number of avenues for me. Um, in terms of exhibitions, um, there was a, a landscape photography exhibition in London a couple of years ago that myself and a whole range of, of, of very prestigious photographers put together, which was which was fantastic. Um, and I've got to meet Charlie on on a few occasions and things. So so that's been it's been very 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 productive and very helpful and certainly very uh, indebted to to Tony to uh, for introducing me to the, to, to to that uh, to that company. Um, and I, unfortunately, I think like like all landscape photography tour companies, it's been a very difficult year for them. And and uh, you know it's as difficult for all landscape photographers running running tours and workshops at the moment. You know with the pandemic, um, everything is very much on hold. Uh, certainly well into next year, unfortunately. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's a very tough time. Um, I, I've met Charlie last year. I brought him to Aberdeen to do a, a talk, uh, which was a really one of the most rewarding things I've done. And um, I, I loved Charlie. I just loved him. I, I don't think I've ever met someone that I've felt such a warmth for. Um, I just think he he was just the best guy ever. So, um, hmm. um, yeah, great man. Um, OK, this brings us to a special round. Let me know what you think. I'm, I'm open to changing the title here, but I was going to call this round with some echo on my voice, double exposure. And um, it's because I'm going <laughs> <Okay>. to choose <laughs> I'm going to choose a shot of yours, which I uh, would like to ask you about. And then maybe you can choose one that was a great experience as well. And you can tell me about that one. There were a few okay. um, that I, I was going to ask about. The first one I, I nearly was going to go for was the rainbow in Loch Achtjöchten. Oh, but yes. I think... I think I wanted to go for the Aurora and and this one I'm going to say even less right. Uh, is it Yoko? <laughs> Yoko Sarlan. Yeah, that's the one. The Aurora one from it's in Iceland, yeah. isn't it? 
Uh, because it yeah, seems that's, yeah. what, that's the one I was going to ask you about. There seems to be icebergs in the foreground and the aurora yeah. over the top. Can you tell me a bit about that shot or just the experience of being there? Yeah, that was amazing. So that was shot, I think, probably six or seven years ago. Um, and that was um, driving. Uh, we, we just touched down in Iceland um, um, in Keflavik that day and had driven across and that was en route to the hotel um, and I was still in my jeans and my uh, and, a, and a jumper but I wasn't wearing any of the gear that we alluded to earlier on in the in, in the podcast um, so I really was unprepared and my um, tripod was still in the suitcase but the Aurora was just too good and so we stopped just got everything, got stuff out of the suitcases, uh, put on a, a heavy jacket and um, and got down to the water's edge. And what, what made that image um, for me um, a very pleasing image is, is the reflections. Um, so, you know, it wasn't the most spectacular aurora that I've ever seen, but it reflected beautifully and, and, it, and it, it just made the image work really, really well. So it was a, a great experience. Uh, and inter- there's an interesting story, actually, because I, I, the, the image... Um, are a very similar image um, I subsequently saw several months later um, in the national press and um, and I wondered how my image had managed to win the astrophotography the the uh, astrophotographer of the year or whatever it's called there's a, there's a competition there's one of the potties out there and it's for for astrophotography pictures it's a very prestigious competition and in fact it was won by a chap who was standing right beside me at the time um, who took exactly the same we, t- we took exactly the same shot and mm. Uh, and he entered it in this competition and won it um, and won, yeah. uh, uh, well, I think it was a pretty decent cash cash reward too for that image. So, uh, um, but it was amazing yeah. seeing it and seeing his, his take on it and how he had processed it and things. And it, and it, it, was, it was a great image that he shot, but very, very similar mm. to, to, to one of the ones that I did too. Mm. Great experience. And that's, I'm always saying this, but the one of the, the things for me with photography has brought me to so many incredible experiences I just wouldn't have had without uh, photography. So sounds like one of those. Um, and so is there a, a particular picture um, or experience that you've had that you'd like to tell me about that's either it's, it was just a great moment or it's moved your photography along or turned your a corner for some reason? Anything special? Uh- um, a, a, a great moment. Um, you, I mean, you, you, you alluded to a picture at Loch Achtrecht in, in, in Glencoe last year. Um, that was a kind of day of rainbows. And it was one of those days where I had a, a bit of time. My family were doing something else. My, my wife was, was, I think she was working and my daughter was away at some friends. So I had a, a, I had a, a morning and an afternoon to, to nip up to Glencoe and take some pictures. And it was one of those kind of days of kind of sunshine and showers. And um, after I shot the picture of the rainbow in Loch Achtrecht, I, I then drove down into Glen Etiv and um, I saw this this very very heavy cloud in front of me as I headed down the road down Glen Etiv and anybody that's down that road no, no, knows you know as you go all the, it, it goes on for a little bit and you often pass some deer some very heavy cloud and then it was torrential rain it was the rain was just absolutely biblical but out the other end just towards the end um, um, there's a little lock and down uh, down that road called Lock and Ur. Um, and just as I approached this lock and the, the rain started to ease off a little bit and the, I could see the sun in front of me. And as I pulled over on the left hand side, I just there was this most amazing, intense double rainbow um, as the as the cloud just sort of drifted up towards the buckle and it managed to sort of just gr- jump out. No tripod, didn't have time for any of that. There was still rain coming down and just captured this this rainbow down um down a Glen Etive. and it's not it's not my it's not my best picture, but in terms of a, of of a recent experience, it was absolutely incredible. It was so intense, it was just crazy, you know, crazy driving down there, just because I was conscious that there might well be something like something a pot of gold at the end of it, as it were, mm-hmm. and, and there was, and it was just a great experience and an experience. One of these things I'll I'll never never forget, and and as you say, Graham, I mean, it's just amazing how photography takes you to places and gets you doing things that you otherwise you would just never ever do. I mean, as I visited you know so many places and. and gone to you know um so many different countries and and that i would never have gone to um so you know i've got i've got photography to thank for that great experience thanks for sharing that um okay another special round here and work with me here uh, it's a quick fire round and i wanted to call it motor drive okay does that make sense okay okay <laughs> uh, okay <laughs> number one uh, oh, okay 
Okay. Okay. Wide angle or tell. Let me know if you have any other suggestions for the name of this round. I'm open. Okay. Okay. Uh, number okay. one. Wide angle or telephoto. Oh, oh, difficult. Uh, I've got, but I've got to choose one. Um, I'll, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll go telephoto. Okay. Uh, coffee or tea? Oh, definitely coffee. Head or heart? Head. Okay. This is a, a, a really tough one. Beatles or Rolling Stones? Beatles. Uh, okay. What was the last great book, movie, series, album you experienced? Oh, uh, that's easy. I've just finished all three series of The Fall on television, uh, set mm. in Northern Ireland, Gillian Anderson. My wife's even even basing her, her, her clothing choices on it now. It's great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're the second person who's mentioned that to me today. Um, I was speaking to a mum in the <laughs> playground today uh, who was saying, who described it, and I was like, well, it sounds kind of gory, but anyway. Oh, no, it's fabulous. Well worth watching. Good, The Fall. Okay, I'll put the link in the show note. Um, okay. Expensive lens cloth or just the corner of your shirt? Um, can I go halfway house and say um, Tesco's or indeed other brands are available? Microfiber cloth, um, five for about two pound fifty. Oh, cheap lens cloth. Didn't see that coming, honestly. Okay. And what's a weird thing I could find in your camera bag? A weird thing you could find in my camera bag. Um, some. Um, Silicon grease. Okay. Uh, follow up question. Why do you have silicon grease in your camera bag? <laughs> when I go on workshops, I like to be prepared. So I usually take some silicon grease for uh, tripod legs uh, mm-hmm. and other things. And I usually also take a roll of Gorilla Tape for holding things together because you never know when things are going to fall off. I, mm. I've had my, I've had a camera, le- I've had a tripod leg fall off uh, up at the old man store before, and um, mm. I spent a morning trying to buy super glue um, in Portree. Mm. So I was, <laughs> so that that um, silicone stuff, whatever it was, that if, you know how the legs can get um, a bit tacky with mm. the salt water, maybe is that mm. to help free that up? Mm. Yeah, 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 sand and grit. Yeah, yeah, that's good to know. Um, okay, okay, favorite photographer right now. Favorite photographer right now, um, Ragnar Axelson. Okay, say it again. Ragnar Axelson. He's an Icelandic photographer who um, has shot. He shoots exclusively. Shoots exclusively in monochrome, and he has shot um, lots of things, not only in Iceland but in the Faroe Islands, um, in Greenland. Um, particularly the people, um, huskies, that sort of thing. I've got one or two of his books, absolutely fantastic. Picked up one of his books in Keflavik Airport. So, and he's on Instagram. Great. Okay, I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, okay, last one. When do you feel at peace with the universe? Um, I would say I feel at peace with the universe when I am standing probably alone on a beach or at a loch side um, with the camera there, just me um, and some good light. Great answer. Thank you, Mark. Thanks so much for your generous contribution. Um, It's been really interesting hearing about your journey to photography and how you go about your work. I'm sure people are going to get a lot out of this episode. So thanks so much, Mark. Thanks very much, Graeme. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you took something away from that episode. What a great insight into the mind of a really high level landscape photographer. So thanks again to Mark. Follow Mark on Instagram and check out his website. Links to those and links to some of the other things we spoke about are in the show notes. I'd love to connect with you. You can find me on Instagram, YouTube and at the Viewfinders webpage where you can get my free ebook. Again, link below the show. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe, leave a kind review and a five-star rating. It really makes a difference. And if you're a new listener, why not check out some other episodes while you're there? Okay, enjoy your photography, be kind, and I'll see you out there.